over the years, I've uh, heard of families, maybe you have too, maybe you, you know families like this, and uh, there's been some big fallout over the years, and uh, members of the family don't talk to each other, uh, they don't have contact with one another, there's uh, sometimes a bitterness that has developed, and all you can say really about that family is that they are completely divided. Now, sometimes people keep that division right to the grave, which is a very sad fact, and yet it does happen. Uh, that's reality for some families in our province, and maybe even uh, known to you. It, it's sad, isn't it? Because we expect families to stick together, because your family are the people who really will care most about you. They're the ones that you ought to have the closest earthly bond with. And we need each other in our families. We should be united. We should not be divided and fragmented. Now, we're thinking about the Christian family, uh, the Church of Jesus Christ, and we're looking at the purpose-driven life and this particular section, which is entitled, We Are Formed for God's Family. And that's simply saying that when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we come personally and individually, but the immediate consequence of that is that we are drawn together into fellowship and relationship with other Christians in the church in which we find ourselves. Now, when you bring together a group of sinners, because that's at the end of the day what we are, and you have close contact with one another, there is a possibility that there might be divisions. There's a danger that there could be fallouts and the church could be fragmented. And chapter 21 in The Purpose Driven Life, I trust you've had a chance to read it, deals with the subject of protecting the church or making sure that unity is maintained, that divisions do not happen, that the church remains united. Now, I don't think it's talking about the church worldwide because there are those who long for there to be some kind of union between all the denominations, but of course, it's never going to happen. I think we need a cordial and gracious recognition of other churches and uh, the work that they do. But I think this is primarily applied to the local church, the one that you find yourself in. And I want to turn to that passage that I even read earlier on, Ephesians chapter 4, if you'd like to turn to it and follow along, because this chapter tells us why we should maintain unity in the church and how we can achieve that. So I want to simply ask four questions this morning about the unity of God's people in the church. And the first question I want to ask is this, what is unity? Unity. What is unity? Now, we, we might think it means being the same, having the same opinions and views and gifts, but of course that is not the way the church is. There's a great variety in the church, isn't there? And if you read further on down in that passage in Ephesians chapter 4, it talks about he gave gifts, some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers. And he talks about the body of Christ. And we know the body has all those different parts. So there's a great variety within the church. We're all different, with different personalities and strengths and weaknesses and interests. That's the way we're made, isn't it? We don't always agree. It's not really possible but unity means that we stay together. We don't allow any differences to drive us apart and to spoil our relationships. You see, unity is more than just being in the same building. We could all be in this building together and still be very fragmented. It doesn't just mean having your name on the same communion roll. It involves remaining connected with one another, interacting with each other in a Christian way, relating to each other in a loving 
manner as Paul refers to in verse 2 there in Ephesians 4. Now that doesn't mean, you see, that we sweep things under the carpet and that we don't ever express our opinion. It doesn't mean that we say nothing if something concerns us. It doesn't mean that we're afraid to voice our opinion because we might annoy somebody else. We ought not to ignore something that we feel is wrong. But the important thing is this, that we ought not to allow those things to come between us. So unity is really staying together in Christian fellowship. And Paul says here, he calls it in verse 3, the unity of the Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit. Now, you see, we can't really be in the church, the church that is the body of Christ, unless we have the Holy Spirit, unless we belong to Jesus Christ. But if we have the Holy Spirit and belong to him, when that, that's what brings us together. And it's the Holy Spirit that gives us a desire to maintain that unity, doesn't it? And to help us to pursue that and to achieve it. So that's what unity is. Not everybody being the same, not everybody always agreeing, but remaining together, connected. The second question is this, why does unity matter? Because you see, you could say, well, it's part of life, isn't it? We fall out. We don't get on with some people. We stop speaking to others. They stop speaking to us. Relationships break down. That's just the way it happens. So we ought not to get too upset about it. Well, let me stress, of course, that that is not the case. There is a lot at stake in the unity of the church. Let me mention one or two things. Unity, if it's not present, harms the church. It hurts people. People can be discouraged. If you cut yourself off from somebody or if they cut themselves off from you, then a wound can be inflicted and progress can be hindered in the life of that person or in your life. So it can do great harm to other people in the church. It's not something that individuals can easily shrug their shoulders and shake off. Sometimes it goes very deep and can do great damage. In Galatians chapter 5 and verse 15, Paul says, If you go on biting each other and devouring each other, you are in danger of destroying each other. So we can just picture the, the Christians in the church in Galatia, can't we? Biting each other and devouring each other. And he says, if you keep on doing that, you're in danger of causing destruction to the church. We can imagine these people disagreeing in a very aggressive way and doing great damage. We talk today, we hear a lot of talk today about self-harm, people harming themselves. Well, this is a source of great self-harm to the church if disunity exists. So it harms the church, but it also hurts the gospel, doesn't it? Because the message of the gospel is about people being reconciled to God, forgiven by him, and acceptable to him, and then being reconciled to each other. The gospel breaks down barriers, doesn't it? Brings people together in Jesus Christ. Now, that happened in an amazing way in the church in Ephesus, the one that Paul is writing to here in this letter. He refers to it earlier on, the Jew and the Gentile were brought together in the church in Christ. Now, there could have been no greater division than between the Jew and the Gentile. The Jew called the Gentile a dog. As far as he was concerned, the Gentile was an animal. And yet they were brought together. And Paul says he has taken down the dividing wall, brought you together, united you in one new community. And you see, if that unity is destroyed, then it discredits the message of the gospel, doesn't it? Before a world that is watching. 
Because if that happens, they look at the church and they say, well, they're no better than anybody else. They're no different from us. They just fall out the same as the rest of us. And the credibility of the gospel is undermined. You see, a a church united in Christ is a great advert for the, the good news of the gospel, isn't it? So if there's disunity, it harms the church, it hurts the gospel, and more importantly, I think it dishonors God. You see, the church belongs to him. It was God who brought the church into existence. He gave his son to die, to suffer, to be sacrificed, so that the church, the New Testament church, might exist. Cost God dearly to have the church as his his family. The church is the most precious thing in the universe as far as God is concerned. He loves it dearly, calls it the apple of his eye, his family. And God wants the church to be united. And he grieves when there's division between his children. Now, we know that in our own families, don't we? If you have children and they're not on good terms with each other, that brings you great sorrow, doesn't it? It's your heart's desire that they would agree and be friendly and have good relationships. And it it really causes you great joy when you see that in your family, doesn't it? It does matter. Unity is important. Giving out the prizes to the children for League of Church loyalty. I wonder if we would get a prize for League of Church loyalty. And I don't mean just turning up on Sunday, but loyal to one another so that we maintain the bond of unity. wonder if we get a prize. Would it be first prize, second prize, third prize, no prize? If we're loyal to the church, then we will want to maintain the unity amongst God's people. So that's the second question. Why is it important? And the third question is this. What hinders unity? What hinders unity? Well, if we look at the passage, Paul tells us what will promote unity. So that says to me that the opposite of what he commends to us is what will actually hinder unity. And what we discover as we look at these things is it really essentially depends on our attitudes to each other. Let me just pick out some of the things that Paul refers to. He says, be completely humble. Now, what's the opposite of being humble? Well, it's being proud, isn't it? So, in other words, pride is something that threatens or hinders the unity of the church. What does it mean to be proud? Well, I think it means to be filled with a sense of our own importance. It's to feel that my opinion counts. My way matters. My will must prevail. It's to be unwilling to compromise, quick to take offense, and slow to make up. So if we are proud, then that will hinder the unity of the church, at least in terms of the people that we deal with we feel that we're really the one that is most important. There's another word that Paul uses here. Uh, He says we ought to be humble, so we're not to be proud. He also says we're to be gentle. Now, what's the opposite of being gentle? Well, it's being aggressive, isn't it? And dealing roughly with people. Now, sometimes this can be excused uh, and it can be conveyed to others as simply openness and honesty. People say sometimes, I say what I think. There's no back doors in me. I just speak my mind. Now, Paul later in this passage says, speak the truth in love. And that's fine. But when saying what we think and speaking our mind becomes an excuse for being rude or aggressive, treating people unkindly, then it will threaten and hinder the unity of the church. 
can drive people away and create division. Another word that Paul uses here in verse 2, he says, be patient. So, what's the opposite of patient? Well, impatient, isn't it? What does it mean to be impatient? Well, it means to have a short fuse, to be quick-tempered, not to give other people time, to be easily frustrated by others, to be irritated by those around us. So if we are impatient, then that can hinder the unity of the church. Because Paul says, be patient. And then he says, bearing with one another in love. So what's the opposite of bearing with one another? Well, that's being intolerant, isn't it? Of the weaknesses of others. Being unsympathetic to their struggles and their trials and their limitations. It's the spirit which expects people to shape up, not giving them any room to develop and to grow and to mature and to accept them if they are struggling on that journey. It's the same spirit, I think, which refuses to forgive, which says they shouldn't have done it, they shouldn't have said it, but they did, and I'm finished. Not bearing with others, but being intolerant. I remember when I was younger, living in Antrim, there was a, a great, we didn't have all the computers, of course, and the games, and we were outside a lot. And football, of course, was a, a common uh, pastime. And we would just turn up, and there would always be, particularly at weekends, of course, other always be a gang of, of other fellows there and pick two teams and you'd have a game of football but there was one guy who regularly brought the ball with him and he was uh, had enough money to be, always be able to have a nice football and if he was there then you could have a game the only problem was this that if the game didn't go his way or if anybody annoyed him or tackled him and he didn't like it you know what he did you're ahead of me he took his ball and went home. So no game. So you had to really treat him with kid gloves, didn't you? Go gentle on him. Don't tackle Johnny because he'll take his ball and he'll go home and there'll be no game. So really, whatever side Johnny was on really pretty much had to win. And you had to really go gently with him. Now it's easy in the church, isn't it? We'll say, well, I'll take my ball and I'll go home. And I will have nothing to do with you because you annoyed me, you upset me, and that's it. We can have a critical spirit as well, can't we? It finds fault and complains and gossips. We're not bearing with others. We're being intolerant. Well, we are a bunch of sinners. And all churches are imperfect. I know there are people who go on a journey, they're looking for the perfect church. There is only one perfect church, and it's not here, it's in heaven. There are no perfect churches on the earth. And it is inevitable, isn't it, that people will disagree. Sometimes people will offend others, and sometimes people will be hurt. But unity is threatened when we allow those things to come between us, to separate us, to drive us apart. And the only winner is Satan himself. It doesn't have to be that way. We can avoid it. And lastly, I want to ask this question, and very briefly, what promotes unity? What promotes unity? Well, he tells us the qualities that we need. He mentioned them earlier on to look at the opposite, and the greatest, of course, is humility. Not being full of ourselves, not being self-centered, knowing what we are, knowing our feelings and our weaknesses and our sin, and not focusing on ourselves, not thinking more highly of ourselves than we should, not having our own interests at central place. He says we're to be gentle and patient, treat others kindly, not be roughshod with them, but bear with them, make alliances. Remember, God is not finished with them, and he's not finished with you. The difference in the church should be this, not that we don't ever disagree or even fall out, but that we make up when we do. If we've hurt someone, we apologize. 
If we've been offended, we forgive. Paul says, love covers a multitude of sins. And there are times when some people maybe annoy you, say something, do something, it really gets you. But you don't have to make a big thing of it. Because love covers over a multitude of sin. And you say, look, they're a brother or sister in Christ, and I love covers it. I'm not going to hold a grudge. But if there's a grievance and you can't cover it by love, then you need to go and tell that person. Not tell others, but tell the person. That's what Matthew 18 instructs us, to try and put it right. In verse 3, he says, Keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. In other words, to desire to be at peace with others. Not peace at all costs, not peace at the expense of truth, but desiring to be at peace. And I think one of the keys is the very first phrase in in chapter 3, in verse 3, Paul says, make every effort. And that means to strive earnestly. It means to value unity, to work hard to preserve it, and to maintain it. And I think the real secret to this is at the end of that passage, because notice on seven occasions, Paul uses the word one. He says there's one body, one spirit. You're called to one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. What Paul is saying is think of all these things that unite you together. You have the same spirit. You belong to the same Savior. You have the same hope of heaven, same faith in Jesus Christ. Baptism was the sign of your commitment to him. He gives a catalog of those things that unite God's people together. And isn't it true that there's so much that unites us in the church? And don't we want the same things, the kingdom of God to be extended, Christ to be honored, and Satan to be opposed? that is our focus, if that's what we concentrate on, if that's what's most important to us, then unity will flourish. And our concern will be to strive for that, and we will not be easily divided. At Mary Mary Irvine's funeral yesterday, we were talking about the fact that she really became a mother figure in her family. Uh, to her younger siblings because her father died when she was young and uh, her, her mother was unwell. And she, at a young age, she became really the mother of that family. And then the tribute that her family made said that this happened, when you think that this happened during the Second World War, it makes it even more astounding. And Mary had one particular desire, and that was to see her family, her younger siblings, raised. But think of it in the context of the war. Think of how united people were during the Second World War. Why were they united? Because they had a common purpose and a common goal and a common enemy. And they recognized that nothing was more important in their day and generation than standing against the aggression and violence of Nazi Germany. And so they were united together. Think of the things that people did, the sacrifices they made to stay together because of their common goal. And you and I have that common goal, don't we? Our primary concern is to be the glory of God and the good of his people. And if that's what matters most to us, then we will stand together. Let me finish with this little illustration. I want you to imagine that we've all got a piano in the house. Now, some of you have a piano. And all of our pianos are out of tune. But somebody comes along as a tuner, and they have tuning forks. And they come to your house, and they tune your piano. And they come to my house, and they tune my piano. And they go to somebody else's house, and they tune their piano. And they go around all the pianos in our congregation. What do we discover at the end of it? All of our pianos will be in tune. Because they are all tuned to the same tuning fork. And that's how we know. And if we were to bring all those pianos together and play the chord of C, well, if it wasn't me playing it, the chord of C, they would all be in tune because they're all taking their cue 
from the same tuning fork. And friends, is, is there an illustration of that, that if we take our cue from the one that we belong to, if we want above everything to, to be like him, to reflect his grace and love, forgiveness, and to bring honor to him, if that's the case, will it mean that we ourselves will be united? I think it will. And I think in our unity, we can truly exalt the one who died and rose again to bring us to him and to each other. And one day into that place where there is only complete unity amongst all of God's people.